Hi, it's Kiffin Low Bates here, and while I was away on vacation for a week, two things have happened here in Finland. One is that spring has sprung. There are birds singing everywhere, all the snow is gone, and it's got quite warm, so that's wonderful. And the other wonderful thing that happened is that someone unexpectedly shipped me a Bitcoin miner to play around with. So I thought it would be fun to make a video explaining something about the practicalities of Bitcoin mining. So I'm not going to go into details about um, how cryptographic hash functions work or how mining underpins the Bitcoin network or stuff like that. I'm just going to look at it purely from a systems admin perspective, namely how on earth does one get a miner up and running? What are the profits, if any, going to be if you're running a miner? And what are the issues surrounding using Bitcoin miners? So the miner that I received is called a Lucky Miner version 7. I believe now there is a Lucky Miner version 8 out there, so presumably that's why my kind benefactor sent me the old one. Um, and the Lucky Miner version 7 has a hash rate of 1 tera hashes per second. So I guess that's the first thing we should look into, and that is all the miners out there are competing with each other to find the next Bitcoin block. Uh, if they find a block, they get the block reward, which is currently 3.125 Bitcoins, and they get all the transaction fees. So in practice, finding a block gives you about $300,000 worth of Bitcoin, making it a very tempting thing to go after. Now, because there are all these miners out there and they are all performing the same function, namely hashing and hashing and hashing to try to find a block that satisfies the network protocols, um, there's an awful lot of hashing going on. And in fact, I just looked up the number and it was 778 exahashes per second. So the first thing we have to look at therefore really is what is an exahash? And that exa prefix is a measure of scale. Uh, if you've had anything to do with computers, you're probably familiar with uh, kilobytes, um, gigabytes, and maybe even terabytes as um, indicators of the amount of memory or the amount of disk space that a uh, computer has. Or if we're talking about processing, you might have heard that your processor is a 2.5 gigahertz processor, for example. So Kilo means a thousand, mega means a million, giga means a thousand million or a billion, and tera means a million million. And then the next one up is peta, which is a thousand million million. And then finally, exa means a million million million. So when I said that my miner has one tera hashes per second in hashing power, and then I said that the whole network out there has 780 exa hashes per second. Well, to go from tera to peta is a thousand, to go from peta to exa is another thousand. So basically the network out there is 780 million times more powerful than my specific machine. And that means that my one tera hash per second miner has a 1 in 780 million chance of finding the next block compared to the rest of the, next, uh, of the network. So on average, there would have to be 780 million uh, blocks found for me to have a chance of being a person who found one of those in that period. It's, you know, it's probability. Um, if you have a 1 in 2 chance of uh, a coin coming up heads, then the expected number of times you have to toss the coin is going to be a couple for you to probably get a heads. Oh, of course, it's not guaranteed, and that's the same with the mining here. When I say that 780 million blocks would have to be find, found for me to find a block, it's not guaranteed, or I could find two or five or be incredibly lucky and find a hundred in that same period of time. But anyway, what it does give you is a measure of how insignificant my miners hashing rate is compared to the network as a whole. And indeed, the uh, big mining companies out there who are pursuing this as a business <clears throat> have way, way in excess of what my little miner sitting on my bedroom floor at the moment 
uh, does in terms of hashing power. So you don't really need to know what the hashing is, you just need to know where you stand in the league compared to other mining exercises going on out there. <clears throat> now, about a year ago, I set up a little nerd miner which uses an ESP32 chip and some software that's freely available and is open source that also allows you to mine. That device has a 80 kilohertz, no, not hertz, 80 kilo hash mining rate. And of course, it's completely unlikely to find a block. Technically, it could find one, but the odds are astronomically against it. And that's why these miners, the nerd miner and this lucky miner, are called lucky miners because really what you're doing is the uh, technical equivalent of buying a lottery ticket in the Powerball and hoping you're going to win. You're, you're probably not. <clears throat> Somebody always does, and there are instances out there of solo miners, as they're called, people who are not mining as part of a pool, and I'll be talking about pools in a moment. There are solo miners out there that have been lucky enough to find a block, but uh, in practice, not going to happen. Don't go out and buy some Bitcoin miners thinking that it's going to bring you some significant extra money because the odds are it won't if you play it like a solo miner. If you join a pool, then you will make some money, but you probably won't be able to offset the electricity costs and the hardware costs of the miner. So again, unlikely to be profitable. Um, it's fun as a little hobby to tinker around with and start gaining a better understanding of how Bitcoin works but uh, not something worth pursuing as um, an economic strategy um, as an individual. Anyway, so I said I was going to talk a bit about pools. So what was discovered fairly early on, once lots of Bitcoin miners came online because Bitcoin started to become valuable, is that doing it alone uh, wasn't going to cut it anymore. And I think that era arrived fairly quickly. I think it was only about a couple of years after Bitcoin launched that solo mining became not a viable strategy for making Bitcoin. And uh, pools work by groups of people basically mining together. Uh, the idea being that if I'm mining and you're mining and somebody else is mining and we're all um, we agree to share any profits that we make from one of us striking it lucky and finding a block. So this is a bit like joining a lottery club where a group of you in the office all buy tickets together. So let's say there's 20 or 30 of you. Um, you're all buying one ticket each. And then if you all win, then you share the lottery proceeds amongst each other. It means that the payout is less, but the chance of there being a payout becomes higher for the individual. So that's the analogy for what Bitcoin mining in a pool is all about. And as is in keeping with the decentralized nature of Bitcoin, mining in pools is kind of done in a sort of a decentralized way in that the individual participants have no idea who each other are. There are The mining pools tend to be operated in a centralized manner, but most of the ones I've seen allow you to participate uh, anonymously and uh, you can kind of join or leave at will, so it's kind of permissionless too. However, there is that central entity that is creating the candidate blocks for the mining pool to mine. And this is where I can mention something called the Stratum Protocol. Over time, people have developed a protocol to allow the pooling of mining efforts and that protocol is called Stratum. And what you have is you have one centralized entity that is creating candidate blocks for the Bitcoin network with um, this nonce value, this number used only one part, um, that is meant to be changed again and again as you hash. <clears throat> what they do is they keep track of which range of numbers are being tried by which miners out there. So they, you connect your miner to one of these mining pools the uh, mining pool then sends you a candidate block and a range of numbers for your miner to try and your miner then turns away trying them and then if another block is found then the uh, mining pool detects this and sends out a new candidate block for you and a new range of numbers for you to try to attempt to find a valid block and uh, it is actually surprisingly simple to configure you get a URL 
So where uh, your server location, you get a port number for your miner to connect to and you uh, fire it up and then it just sits there and runs and it is actually quite dull to watch. And once you've got it all up and running, you just have your miner sitting there in the corner doing its thing, getting the information from the mining pool servers. And over time, um, you and the other miners together will hopefully have enough processing power or rather hashing power to find a block and then the reward is split among all the miners in proportion to the amount of mining processing power that they contributed to the uh, effort. Um, now this video has been going on for quite some time so I'll wrap it up but in the next one I think it might be fun to talk a bit about how mining pools protect themselves from people faking their hashing um, and maybe a bit more about the stratum protocol but i think for today that's probably it anyway mining uh, for an individual something that you can do as a hobby it's not the world's most fascinating hobby but to be honest uh, from my perspective neither is fishing there's a lot of just sitting there watching it hum away in the corner doing nothing in the same way that an angler sp can spend hours just looking at the float um, floating there on the surface of a lake, waiting for a fish to bite. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video soon. Bye for now.